Thank you so much, Erin. And it is a real honour to be published by Broken Sleep Books. Um, yeah, and it was very weird. I can honestly really um, sort of sympathise with your experience of going to the Royal Society for Literature event because I felt something very similar. I spent ages googling black tie for women and it just kept showing me pictures of bridesmaids dresses and of course so I went in a bridesmaids dress because that's all I had. I couldn't afford to buy a new dress um, and everyone there was just in their clothes that they'd worn at work um, the day before because you can get away with that in London um, and I just felt really out of place but I was made to feel really really welcome and um, and this book for me I mean this this is such a personal book for me this represents this beautifully typeset and produced book it represents a coming out as a disabled person into the world um, uh, I wrote it back in 2014 it was um, highly commended in the New Welsh Writing Awards but it was never published except in a tiny extract form and so I've been able to keep denying the fact that I'm actually disabled and I struggle hugely with um, my energy levels and with pain. Um, every day is different. Some days I'm rushing around and everything's fine. Other days I'm just, you know, stumbling around the house or I have to stay in bed. And so it really means so much to me that this book is coming out through Broken Sleep Books who are so incredibly inclusive and to be part of this family is absolutely amazing. And, and before I start getting tearful, I'm gonna just read from the book. Um, and I'm going to start with the opening section in crisis. Imagine me for a moment clinging to a rock face, legs in the shade of the rising shoulder of Trivan on the other side of the gully, head illuminated by early September sunshine. My hair sticking out in squirrel tufts from beneath the helmet is the colour of leaves in the autumn. But the trees around here haven't quite used up the sun yet, are still in their green dresses and hats. I'm not dressed for climbing jeans, baseball shoes, a top that could spill my cleavage unless I maintain a suitable posture. But here I am, 30 feet up in the air, clinging with bone pale fingers to the smallest cracks and fissures, my aching toes pushing hard into a crevice of solid ancient stone. I am moss, I am lichen, I am the trembling tree rooted in the memory of dirt beside me. And I am tired. I was tired before I started, I was tired watching the others as they skittered up like lizards on hot rock, arms and legs wide and reaching for muscle tearing holds before spinning down like spiders with arms and legs wide in triumph. I sat on a smooth cold stone at the bottom, feeling my own weight in stillness, every joint a dull and rusty ache, deciding not to even try. But here I am. Imagine me clinging to the rock face, then leave me there a while. Don't worry. I won't fall and crack my skull like a bird's lost egg on the rocks below. I have a harness and rope, <clears throat> a helmet to ensure safety. I'm leaning into the sun-baked roughness of that time-carved wall and not able to move another inch. Leave me there a while. Solar power. Summer starts for me with dandelions. They erupt after the pale agreeing heads of the daffodils have withered to brown and begun to relent. The roadsides and fields are ablaze with them. They are my favourite flower. And as I drive along the dual carriageways and bee roads that twist colubrine through Gwynedd and Unismon, I am grinning like a kid on Friday afternoon. Their magnitude and attitude fuels me. So far, it has been what everyone describes as unseasonably warm for this time of year. But the earth doesn't know this and just silently shifts gear and gets on with it without checking a calendar, worrying or rejoicing. No matter how hot the early sun beats down, the dandelions burn defiantly back, heads upturned, dark green arms spread wide to catch their energy source, to turn it into chlorophyll, to grow even taller. As I drive past the fields where their gold coin optimism is piled and scattered, I feel compelled to pull over. I want to step through the thorny claws of defensive hedges and roll down the hill as I did as a child, sending millions of things or legs and wings into the hazy air and smelling the dark green of crushed leaves and stems beneath me. I think of the sticky white blood that stained my young skin, that made perfect printed O's of bitter sap on my clothes, and I want to feel it again, knowing its harsh taste somewhere in my cell memory, knowing how hard it is to wash off, how red the skin goes with the rubbing. Worth it for the tumble, for the letting go. I want that. 
the pure energy of gravity pulling me down the slope faster and faster, kinetic and absolute and leaving me dizzy and out of breath despite the lack of effort on my part. Knowing that the destructive path of my rolling body won't stop them, that's part of the joy. Even the strimmers and ride-on mowers the council workers used to decapitate and crush all striving spring growth can't stop the dandelions. Two, maybe three days after the slaughter, as the severed stalks and dead insects begin to dry out and brown under the weight of the sun, the lights will come back on. One by one, orange and angry and joyful, their energy is indestructible, their resilience unstoppable. But mine isn't. I can't stop and roll in their colourful heat or collect their rich dark bitter leaves to feed a pet rabbit long since dead. I have an appointment to attend. The clock on the dashboard says I'm early, but not early enough to stop and use up the last dregs of my own energy in a game. My arm rests on the open window frame of the driver's side door, bare to the sun bar for the layer of Factor 50 sunscreen that is now a daily routine. A smooth, invisible layer of synthetic skin between me and nature, a shield to defy the elements and cut off all communication between the sun and my skin. Almost all. My skin is warm, hot even, and I know time will limit my protection. Unlike those brazen dandelions who steal the power and colour and heat of that hanging ball of flame in the sky and turn it into a billion suns of their own, I cover up, smear on my creams and oils to stop its power getting through. UVA and UVB are my mortal enemies. I check each beauty spot and mole punctuating my skin regularly to see if any rays have made it through, if there are any signs of change. My skin should stay the same colour all year round, pale, safe. Since time began, the sun has been a primary source of energy for all living things on the planet. As I sit in the traffic, I can see its shimmering heat reflecting above the tin roofs of the car, cars ahead. I try to think of something that does not demand its radiating gift to survive and thrive. Perhaps within the darkest caves, below the deepest seas, there are creatures more pale than me that don't know what it is to bask in and soak up heat and light. In fact, I know there are. I've seen the documentaries and watched in fascinated abjection the footage of their eyeless rubbery bodies exposed by artificial light and underwater technology. But even these black spaces are part of something bigger. They interact with an ecosystem that does rely on the sun. You only need to look at the faces in town in the slump of a January afternoon to know that sunlight is life. My skin prickles, sweat glues me to the seat through my shirt. It's only May and therefore not even summer yet. The fuel light on my dashboard comes on, a bleep to tell me I only have 76 miles to go until the engine stops. I can go to a garage on the way home, pour diesel made from crude oil remnants of ancient forests grown under the same sky above me now into the tank and power myself home on the carbon memory of the sun. The car park smells hot and green, windows reflect white light that makes me squint in pain, and as I pass the fuzzy shrub borders, bees and insects vibrate in suckling glee. Every step I take is an effort, like walking through hot, shifting sand. My knees and ankles throb with it. Inside, the examination room is cool. The thudding turn of the fan sinks with my heartbeat as latex fingers explore my skin for signs of damage, each speckle, freckle and dark mark explored and measured, while I think of my mother and the operation last year to excise a lemon wedge-shaped area of tissue with cancer at the core. Nothing unusual. Keep checking. Wear sunscreen. What about the fatigue, the aching joints? Could it be vitamin D deficiency, rickets? I don't eat meat, I don't let the sun close. I keep that second skin of chemicals and cloth between me and it's healing, hurting radiation. Could it be I need the sun? I am dismissed with repeated instructions to keep checking, to keep using sunscreen. There is nothing to suggest anything serious. Drink more milk. Thank you.